How many thinks it's all right for me to come down here and preach? Put your hand up, please. All right. Praise the Lord. Good, 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 good. Praise the Lord. Now, I know that every sermon ought to have a train of thought. I also believe that every sermon ought to have a terminal, not just a train of thought, but a terminal. So I don't plan to preach too long, but I do want to mind the Lord. And how many want me to mind the Lord? Put your hand up, please. Here's what the Lord spoke to my heart about. He said, I want you to read Galatians 2.20. I don't know how much preach the Lord is going to get out of me. But he said, I want you to read Galatians 2.20, a beautiful verse of Scripture. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Did you know I believe that this Christian life is the happiest and the noblest life that an individual can possibly live? But it's no bed of roses, and neither is it a holiday journey. I believe from the time that you enter into this Christian life until you, until you rest in the haven of rest, I believe it's a battle. But it's a glorious battle, is it not? If I were to invite you to become a Christian this morning and tell you that living for Jesus Christ was one long sweet song, I would be deceiving you. Yet I'd rather fight the good fight of faith and endure the toils and the hardships along this way, have Jesus Christ as my daily portion, find a place with him in heaven at the end of the way as to go through this life without Jesus Christ, enjoy the fruits of sin, gain the whole world, and then at the end of the way, lose my own soul. Now to rightly live this Christian life, I believe an individual must be completely surrendered to the whole will of God. That's what we heard about last night. I appreciated that message so very, very much. Let me say that again. To rightly live this Christian life, I believe an individual must be completely surrendered to the whole will of God. Not halfway, not three quarters of the way, but completely surrendered to the whole will of God. Now Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. What did he mean? We all know what it meant for Christ to be crucified on the cross. Out yonder on a hill far away, I can see three crosses outlined against the horizon. Hanging upon the middle cross is the Son of God, dying not for his sins, but for your sins and my sins and the sins of the whole world. I see that sun as it drops behind those clouds. I hear Jesus cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Later on we hear him cry out, I thirst. And finally, he said, it is finished. And he rubs his chin to apostle's chest and he gives up the ghost. Now we all know what it meant for Christ to be crucified on the cross. But ladies and gentlemen, what did the apostle Paul mean when he said, I am crucified with Christ? He didn't hang on the cross. He was decapitated. They cut his head off. And yet he said, I am crucified with Christ. What did he mean? I got the dictionary down, looked up the word crucifixion. And Mr. Webster said the word crucifixion or the word crucify means death. In other words, if we're crucified with Christ, we are dead to sin. We're dead to self. We're dead to the old lust. We're dead to the old habits. We're dead to the old ambitions. And we take our stand over here with Jesus and we say to the sinful worldly things over there, as far as you're concerned, I'm dead to you. You have no more power with me than you do over a dead body because don't you see, I am crucified with Christ. And here's the secret of being able to say those words, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Will it be all right if I be your pastor for a little while this morning? I want to be your pastor for a little while this morning and tell you what kind of a Christian I'd like for you to be. I want everybody in this congregation to be a crucified Christian. I ask you to have crucified feet. And the reason why I believe that you ought to have crucified feet is because Jesus had crucified feet. They took those blessed feet and crossed them on the upright beam of the cross and in agony and blood they were nailed to the tree. I believe that the Lord wants us to have crucified feet. 
What do I mean by crucified feet? I mean that our feet ought to be very careful where they take us. Our feet should never go into places that will bring a dishonor to the cause of Christ. Our feet should never take us into places that will bring a dishonor to the church. But on the contrary, our feet ought to be walking in the wounded footsteps of the Son of God. I opened up the Bible this morning uh, under John chapter 13 uh, and I read where Jesus girded himself with the towel and humbled himself and washed the disciples' feet. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the Lord wants us to have clean feet. Our feet should never carry us into the slimy places of this old world. But on the contrary, our feet should take us to those who are poor and lost and needy. In the name of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I found today in the book of Romans chapter 10, I looked at verse 15 uh, and I found out where all of us could have beautiful feet. Would you like to know how to have pretty feet? All you have to do is just open up your Bible to Romans chapter 10 and look at verse 15. Uh, It said, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace uh, and bring glad tidings of good things. I believe if we're crucified with Christ, our feet ought to take us to those who need our Christ and we ought to take the glad tidings of good things. Did you know your feet is the first thing that gets cold about you? I don't know about you, but boy, I tell you, when my feet gets cold, I'm cold all over. You ever wake up in the wee hours of the morning uh, and you were freezing to death uh, and you reached down and got the covers and pulled them up around your neck but you were still freezing to death? You didn't realize your big old clawed hoppers uh, were sticking out from under the covers down at the foot of the bed. And when you pulled your little old feet under the covers, uh, you begin to get warm all over. That's the way it is spiritually. How many times have I had people come up to me and say, Brother Smart, I can't understand it. I'm saved and I'm sanctified, but oh, I see, I'm just not as happy as I feel like the Lord wants me to be. I pay my tithe, I give my offerings. I said, Sister, it's not your pocketbook that's cold. I said, it's your feet that's cold. Brother Swart, I go to church every Sunday morning and Sunday night. I even go to Wednesday night prayer meeting uh, and I give a testimony, uh, but it seemed like that I'm still cold and I'm dry. I said, it's your feet that's cold. I said, if you'll start doing something for the glory of God, it won't be long until you'll get warm all over spiritually. Forget your selfish belly and start living for somebody else. If you live for self, you'll live in vain. But if you live for others, you'll live again. Jesus died thinking about others. And I believe if we're crucified with Christ, uh, I believe that our feet will take us to people that need our Savior. You know, when I think about crucified feet, I think about missions. I believe that the Lord wants the gospel to go around the world and somebody's feet has to take the message. Will you go? But you'll say, Brother Smart, I'm not called to be a missionary. I'm not called to be a pastor. I'm not called to be an evangelist. Well, then the Lord has called you to send others. Are you doing that? Are you helping in God's great redemptive program for the whole world? I studied a little bit of mythology, you know. And Mercury was a messenger of the gods. He had winged feet. Spiritually speaking, uh, we are messengers uh, of our loving Heavenly Father uh, and we ought to have wing feet. Our feet ought to be swift to take us to those who are poor and lost and needy. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We ought to take the gospel to the lost and the dying world. Crucified feet. I ask you to have crucified feet. Oh, be careful little feet where you go. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, God, don't let our feet take us into places where sin's allurement is. But help our feet to take us to those who need our Christ. In the name of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Then I ask you to have crucified hands. Jesus had crucified hands. They stretched those blessed arms out on the cross beam of the old rugged cross and in agony and blood, those hands were nailed to the tree. Those blessed hands were crucified hands, if you please. Those hands have swept the clouds from human skies. 
Those hands that touched the fevered brow and brought healing. Those blessed hands that touched the blinded eyes and brought sight. Those blessed hands that touched the deaf ears and brought sound. Those blessed hands that touched the lepers and chased the leprosy away. Those blessed hands that fed the poor and washed the disciples' feet. Ladies and gentlemen, if I know anything about the Bible and about Jesus, he had crucified hands. And if we're crucified with Christ, we ought to have crucified hands. Our hands ought to be active in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I opened up the Bible today to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, and I read where Paul said, study to be quiet, mind your own business, and work with your own hands. I like that. That's a three-point outline. Study to be quiet and mind your own business and work with your own hands. He gave you those hands to labor with. I mean to give a good day's work and at the end of the week you ought to reach in and get some of that fruit of your honest toil and lay it aside for the work of the Lord. I'm talking about paying tithe. Did you know there's a real blessing to that individual that pays his tithe? But if you keep that tithe back and use it for yourself, God can't bless you like he wants to. I know some people that's driving stolen automobiles around. I know some people that's eating stolen food. I know some people that's wearing stolen clothes. They take that tithe that rightly belongs to the Lord and they buy automobiles with it or clothes with it or food with it. I believe if you have crucified hands, they will be dead to sin and wrong and dishonesty. You'll start paying your tithe. You'll start giving to the cause of Christ. Jesus had crucified hands. I opened up the Bible to John chapter 20. I looked at verse 28 where Jesus walked into the upper room and the doors were closed and he walked right, but, rock, rock, he walked right into the room without even opening the door. Walked right through the doors. And said to the disciples, peace be unto you. It was Thomas the one who said, I won't believe that Jesus has resurrected unless I see the nail prints in his hands. Well, Thomas happened to be there at that particular time. And when Jesus walked into that upper room, he saw Thomas and he said, Thomas, look. Come on, Thomas. Put your fingers in my hands. You see the nail prints? Come on, Thomas. He pulled his robe to one side. Come on, put your fingers in the side here. You see the nail prints? Do you see the scar? Thomas sat back. He stepped back and threw up both hands and said, My Lord and my God. Jesus had crucified hands. And if we're crucified with Christ, we ought to have crucified hands. Our hands ought to be ministering unto those who need our Christ. He didn't give you those hands to hold a deck of cards with. He didn't give you those hands to hold a cigarette with. He didn't give you those hands to hold a glass of beer with. He didn't give you those hands to flip the pages of of a dirty magazine with. He gave you those hands uh, to labor with and to minister to those uh, who need our Christ. I read there in 1 Thessalonians, I think it's 3.10, if I'm not mistaken, where it said if a person didn't work, he shouldn't eat. But you say, Brother Smart, doesn't the Lord feed the little birds? Yes, but did you ever see a lazy bird? I never did. Mel Trotter said, I've seen a lot of religious bums, but I've never seen a Christian tramp. I've seen a few religious bums. I've seen a few people drive up in the new Cadillacs and get their food stamps. Doesn't the Lord feed the little birds? Yes. But the Lord doesn't throw the food into the nest. How many times have I waken up in the wee hours of the morning uh, and I've looked out the window and I saw the little mother robin uh, hopping around in the yard, cocking her head this way and that way, and pretty soon she sees a big fat worm uh, and she reaches down, gets a hold of her and socks her little feet in uh, and pulls and pulls until finally the worm comes out of the hole and she takes it to her little brood. And she'll do that all day. She'll do that all week. She'll do that until the little birds get big enough where they can fly away on their own accord. Then you know what that mother bird will do? She'll start all over again. She'll make another nest. And she'll have another little brood. What? 
I don't wake you up. I believe with all of my heart that's what the Lord expects us to do is to work and to labor with our hands and give to the cause of Christ and minister to those who are lost without Jesus. God help us. I thought about the fella. I thought about the fella. He threw the Bible away. He threw the Bible away. Somebody said, why did you throw your Bible away? He said, because it had a book of job in it and I don't want anything around me that has work attached to it. Poor fella. I ask you to have crucified hands. Hands that are dead to sin. Active in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear what it said in Revelation 6, 17? The great day of his wrath is coming. Who's going to be able to sin? Would it be the pilgrims? No. Would it be the Nazarenes? No. Would it be the Bible Methodists? No. Would it be the Wesleyans? No. Would it be the holiness crowd? No. The great day of his wrath is coming. Who's going to be able to stand? I found the answer in Psalm 24, 4. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart that hasn't lifted their soul to vanity nor sworn deceitfully. That's the crowd uh, that's going to be able to stand at that day. He that hath clean hands, he's been regenerated. Uh, he that has a clean heart, a pure heart, he's been sanctified. That's the class of people uh, that's going to be able to stand at that day. Woo! Hallelujah for the word. I ask you uh, to have crucified feet and crucified hands. Jesus had crucified feet and crucified hands. Then ask you to have crucified ears. I'm your pastor for a little bit this morning. Aren't you glad I'm not your regular pastor? Crucified ears. Jesus had crucified ears. I can't remember any place in the New Testament where Jesus listened to gossip about anybody. If we're crucified with Christ, we ought to have crucified ears. You hear what Mark said in the fourth chapter, verse 24? Take heed to what you hear. Take heed to what you hear. And there's all kinds of voices floating around here on the campgrounds. All kinds of voices just floating around everywhere. Take heed to what you hear. I know some people, they'll lap up cream with their ears like a cat laps up cream with its tongue. These people lap up gossip just like a cat laps up the cream. I know some people, they don't have a television set before they got a telephone. <laughs> and how they love to listen to that gossip on the telephone. And I think the person that's listening to gossip and never rebukes the individual that's pouring that slop over the telephone, I think they're just as bad in the sight of God as that individual that's pouring that slop over the telephone. Take heed to what you hear. I had a man come up to me some time ago and he said, Brother Smart, you know what I heard about you? I said, hold it. You only heard half of it. If you'd heard the rest of it, it'd have been worse than what you heard. Did you really hear what I, what I heard about you? I said the same fellow that said that about me said it about you. They talk about me, they'll talk about you. They talked about Jesus, they'll talk about you. But that doesn't mean we have to talk back and we have to talk about them. We could just leave it in the hands of the Lord. Take heed to what you hear. Oh, the voices that's in the world today. Some of them are weekday voices. Some of them are weekday voices. Put over a shady deal. Follow the path of least resistance. Forget about what the preacher said on Sunday morning or Sunday night. You've got to look out for yourself, man. That's the voice of the devil. Amen. These weekday voices. And some of these voices are even Sunday morning voices and Sunday night voices. The old devil slips up and said, you're going to go to church this Sunday morning? Why, well, sure am. My pastor expects me. And I want to go to church Sunday morning. I'm going to sit cl close, close up to the front, too. I'm not going to lay in the back. I'm not going to sit in the back. That's where sinners sit. That's where backsliders sit. That's where the latecomers sit. I refuse to sit in the back. I'm going to church this Sunday morning, Mr. Smutty Face, and I'm going to sit up close to the front. 
and I'm going to back up the preacher when he preaches. I'm going to say amen when he preaches. I'm going to shake my head this way when he preaches. I'm not going to sit there like a bump on a log. The devil said, you're going to church this morning? Yes. Why, you don't feel good? It doesn't matter, man. I don't go on feelings. I live the faith. Save the faith, sanctify the faith, and I refuse to allow the devil to get me down in the dumps because I don't feel good. I'm going to church this morning. Oh, how many times have I gone to church Sunday morning, didn't feel like it, but I went anyway, and the Lord blessed me. So you go to church and you listen to the preacher preach and you enjoy the sermon and you felt so much better after the service is over. It seemed like your dinner tasted better. To me, Sunday is the brightest day and the best day of the week as far as I'm concerned. I love Sunday. Then the devil slips up and says, you're going back to church Sunday night? I sure am. Why didn't you go this morning? Yes, but I'm going again tonight. And the devil said, now, if you're not careful, uh, you're going to run a good thing in the ground. Well, if so, bless God, here it goes. I'll run it in the ground. I'm going to church tonight. <laughs> now, the devil's going to talk to you that way, brother. I mean, you got sanctified last night, I presume. And I'm happy for you. But I want you to know the devil's not going to take this sitting down, boy. He's going to do everything that he can to fight you. That's the reason I'm saying uh, have crucified feet, crucified hands, and crucified ears. Don't you listen to the voice of the devil. How many times have I felt his hot breath on my neck trying to get me maybe to lay out of church on Sunday morning because it didn't feel good? And maybe on a Sunday night, I'm going to church Sunday night. Don't you have a little bit of rheumatism? Yes, I do, but rheumatism or no rheumatism, I'm going to church. Aren't you been having a little trouble with your arthritis? I might be, but I'm still going to church tonight. And you go to church, and you sit up close to the front, and you smile at the preacher while he's preaching, and you put your hand up and wave it every once in a while, and you shake your head, and every once in a while you say amen. And if you don't know how to say good night, open up your mouth and spit out the cobwebs and say two syllables, Amen. You'd be surprised how much better you'll feel. You learn to say amen, brother. Amen. Good, hallelujah, hallelujah. I love those old-fashioned amens. And don't worry about what people might think. You say amen anyway. So many people have quenched the spirit along this line. They've quit saying amen that now they can't say amen hardly. Learn to say Amen. After the service is over Sunday night, you walk up to the preacher, shake hands with him. Say, that was a good message. Seemed like you sleep so much better that night. You went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and the devil slips up and said, you're going back to Wednesday night prayer meeting? Why, of course I am. Why didn't you go Sunday morning, Sunday night? Yes. And you're going back this Wednesday night? Yes, I am. You know what's going to happen to you? You're going to have a mild stroke. Stroke or no stroke. I'm going to Wednesday night prayer meeting. Heart attack to no heart attack. I'm going to Wednesday night prayer meeting. I'm going to sit up close to the front and I'm going to rejoice and praise the Lord while the preacher preaches a little bit. And I'm going to testify too. Woo! I refuse to allow the devil to, uh, to hinder me in my testimonies. Uh, I'm going to let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I love these say so meetings. Hallelujah. The more you testify, honey, the better you'll feel. You don't believe it where I'm from, I double dog dare you to try it. The more you testify and praise God, the better you feel physically, spiritually, and mentally. Woo! I'm speaking from experience, I know. Sure, I'm going to Wednesday night prayer meeting. I'm going to set up close to the front, too. I'm going to testify. I don't know what to say, make up something. That's what I do occasionally. Make up something and get up. And while you're testifying, you feel so much better. And you'll say some more than what you thought you'd ever say. 
Yes, sir, I'm going to church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. The pastor expects me there. I'll be there. I want to go. I want to sing with the saints. I want to shake hands with the people. I get to meet new people and maybe get to pray with somebody around the altar. They will slip something and say, you're going to pay your tithe? Of course I am. Why, you know the church doesn't need it. It doesn't matter. I'm supposed to pay my tithe. And I'm going to do it. When the Lord tells me that I should do something, I'm going to do it. And the Bible plainly tells me that if I pay my tithe, he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon me that my soul won't be able to receive. There's a real blessing to that person that pays his tithe. Give at least 10 cents out of every dollar. And if you give one little dime out of every dollar, God will bless you for doing that. And he'll take that 90 cents and stretch it away out here. Woo! Then give an offering. Hallelujah. And if you take your tithe and pay a bill with it, if in case you had to do that and you want to you give it back to the Lord, give 20% interest. That's a fifth. That's what the Bible says. Now listen to me. Learn to pay your tithe. That's the first thing that falls in my house, honey. I don't care if a man gives me a dollar. Ten cents falls out of that dollar. And then I give my offering. I don't pay tithe on my income. I pay tithe on what comes in. I heard that one splash. I pay tithe on what comes in, not just on my income. Sure, I'm going to pay my tithe, Mr. Devil. You better believe I am. Why, you need that money more than they do. It belongs to God, though, Mr. Smutty Face. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. And I'm not going to live with a thief. I'm not going to live with a robber. The Bible said that tithe belongs to the Lord, and that's where it goes. The devil said, you better keep it. You don't have much. You can't afford, I can't afford not to pay my tithe. I will pay my tithe. I will give my offerings. I will rejoice and praise God for the privilege is mine to give to the cause of Christ. Amen. Crucified with Christ, I have crucified ears. Take heed to what you hear. I tell you, we could run faster, shout louder, feel better in a service such as this, do more for Jesus. If we would just... Pray and ask God to help us to be real crucified Christians. Have crucified ears. You heard about the little dog walking down the street. He had big ears, long ears. And he's walking down the sidewalk and all of a sudden he stepped on one of his ears and over he went. He got up and shook himself, went on down the sidewalk, stepped on the other ear and over he went. That little dog was falling over his ears. I know some people in the church have been falling over their ears for years. Years for years. I'm a poet and don't know it. I know some people could shout louder, run faster, do more for Jesus if they didn't hear so much. They hear too much. Did you hear or have you heard? Or is that true? We could have much better victory if we didn't hear so much. I ask you to have crucified ears. Then I ask you to have crucified eyes. Jesus had crucified eyes. You want to read about it? Isaiah 52, 14 says, his visage was marred more than any man's. And I looked up the word visage, and it means countenance, his face, his eyes. His face must have been beaten beyond recognition. They took that crown of thorns and jammed it down on his precious blessed brow and the thorns went into his flesh and amid the spittle and the sweat and the blood trickling down his sweet blessed face went into his eyes. He had crucified eyes. If we're crucified with Christ, we ought to have crucified eyes. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, there's so much in the world 
to see today. The world uses the colored lights, makes it so appealing to the eye. If you don't believe that, go to the newsstands. Look at the magazine covers. Look at the various kinds of books. And if we're crucified with Christ, we've got to look away from those things. I'm crucified with Christ. I have crucified eyes. What kind of magazines do you look at? What kind of books do you read? You live in a divided home? What kind of programs, dirty programs do you watch? I remember the DSs and the preachers coming up to me and saying, now, Brother Smart, television is here, and we're going to have to learn to handle this thing with sanctified fingers. I know what I'm talking about. We've got to learn to handle this thing with sanctified fingers. And now the DSs, as well as the pastors and the laymen, they've gotten the television because the DS got one or because a certain pastor got one. And now they've got one, and they're all hunching over. They stare at the burlesque. They shriek at the horror that flashes and shimmers on the private television screen. When God saved me, he gave me a vision, and he told me to go tell it, and that's the best television I ever had. He saved me and gave me a vision and said, go tell it. Bless God, that's what I've been trying to do. Woo! Hallelujah. And the way is getting brighter day by day. I don't have any trouble with TV. No trouble at all. You know what I did one day? I made a covenant with my eyes. I know you can lust after the opposite sex. You can see them downtown on the drugstore corner. You can see these fellas standing there as the girls go by. These fellas looked them up and down, up and down and checked the measurements and all that stuff, acting like they're at a hog judging contest. And I'll admit the way some of the girls wear their clothes, they look like hogs. Eyes full of adultery. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. There's so much out there to see. How many still love me? Say amen. amen. I love you. I love you so much I'm going to tell you the truth. Why you say I don't like the way you preach? I don't like what you preach. Well, if you dislike this preaching as much as I dislike your ear tickling, back scratching, soft soaping, compromising type preaching uh, or living, uh, you'll vomit before this sermon is over. God help us. <laughs> I thought about Job today. I was reading about it real early this morning. Oh, he was... He was a perfect man in the sight of God. If there was ever a sanctified man, it was old Job. He was the richest man in the East. And with one stroke, all of his riches were taken away. All of his cattle, all of his slaves were taken away just like that. But he never charged God foolishly. It wasn't long till his beautiful family seven boys and three girls he had ten beautiful children and they were together celebrating some kind of a little party of some sort maybe a little picnic when all of a sudden a tornado came through that part of the country and knocked that house down and all ten beautiful children were killed just like that now you see old Job going out to the cemetery and he stands there and looks at those lonely white tombstones Maybe the devil spoke to him and said, this is what's gotten you, servant of the Lord. Look what's happened now. You're a pauper. You don't have any money. And your ten children are dead and buried. And it wasn't too long until his body got a terrible temperature. And it wasn't long until he began to itch and began to scratch. And it wasn't long until he got a terrible disease called elephantitis his body was smitten from the top of his head to the sole of his feet with putrefying boils how many in this congregation ever had a boil put your hand up 
I've had boils all over my body almost. I guess my blood wasn't any good at all at that particular time until Jesus saved me and sanctified me. I had boils, and they're horrible. I was in a camp meeting, and I got a terrible boil on my body. And I tried to preach with that boil. It got bigger and bigger, and while preaching, it bursted, and pus and blood began to ooze out of my clothes. And I told the president, he took me to a doctor. I don't think he was a very good doctor. He's more like a veterinarian. <laughs> and he lanced that thing. Never even gave me a shot. Never squirted anything at all on that boil. He just told me to lie down on this table and get back here and get a hold of the bars and hold on to those bars and grit your teeth. But relax from your waist down. <laughs> My wife didn't want me to tell that, did you, honey? But he was one of these foreigners. And that made it worse. And I grabbed a hold of those bars and I gritted my teeth and prayed and relaxed from my waist down. And he took that knife and he opened it up and it was horrible. Then he took something else and went down beside of that, of that what do you call it, the, the root or what do you call that? The core. Oh, Lord. I couldn't stand it if I'd have had a hammer. I'd have put a pump knot on his head. <laughs> and just before I started to tell him to quit, he stopped. He said, how you doing? I said, okay. <laughs> Sweat was running. He said, I almost got it. I said, I'm almost dead. <laughs> but I, just to make a long story short, I've had boils, and they're horrible. I got to think about that this morning. I said, poor Job, he was smitten from the top of his head down. And you know when you got that many boils, in case you didn't know, there's a foul odor that comes off of your body. And that's exactly what happened to Job. Read it, 17th chapter, the first verse, his breath was corrupt. He had a foul odor on his body, and his breath didn't smell good. And his wife couldn't stand it, I'm sure. And so Job got up and went to the city dump and sat down in the warm ashes and picked up a piece of metal and scraped that pus away from those putrefying boils. His wife came out and said, you're a pretty looking thing sitting there. We lost all of our money. We're broke. Our ten children are gone. And look at yourself. Sitting there on the city dump, covered with boils, and you smell. Why don't you curse God and die? Job said, you foolish woman. And brother, she was. He said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And to make a long story short, I'm glad that the Lord touched Job and he blessed Job and gave him more cattle than he ever had before, twice as much. And he, thank God gave him more money, twice as much as he had. And thank God Mrs. Job had to have 10 more children. Hallelujah, glory to God. I hope and pray. Thank God when Mrs. Job laid down on her back, I hope her tummy looked like Pike, Pike's Peaks. I hope her legs swelled up and looked like stove pipes. That's good enough for her. I hope she couldn't eat anything uh, but, 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 but dill pickles uh, and drink nothing but persimmon juice. That's good enough for her. Woo! Job never charged God foolishly. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know what kept Job? Do you know what gave him? The Lord gave him the fortitude. Do you know what the secret was? You'll find it in Job 31, 1. I made a covenant with my eyes. 
Boys, if we could just make a covenant with our eyes and say before we leave this room, I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. I refuse to look and to lust and to long for. I refuse to do that. I was sitting up on the platform at a certain camp, and the preacher got up out of a seat and came up and said, Psst, Brother Smart, Psst, come here. I walked over to him. I said, what is it? He said, do you see what I see out in that congregation? I looked. I said, no, I don't. He said, man, where's your eyes? I said, on Jesus, where's yours? I don't have to look out in the congregation to find out what to preach. I've got a Bible here that's got plenty of things in there for me to preach. I'm looking to Jesus. But if you want to backslide, just get your eyes off of Jesus and get it on people. You won't last very long. You'll go down like the Titanic did. You won't last very long. If you get your eyes off of Jesus and get it on people, you'll fold up like my wife does her accordion. You won't last long. <laughs> what are you looking at? Are you looking to Jesus? Keep your eyes on Jesus. I ask you to have a crucified tongue. That crucified tongue. That little red muscle that's in your mouth, about three inches long, maybe four. Let's make it five inches. Let's go a little farther. Let's make it six inches. I mean, some people's got some whopper tongues. Did you hear what James said in the first chapter, verse 26? If any man among you seems to be religious and brighteth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, that man's religion is what? Zero. Nothing to it. We could have better victory, shout louder, run faster, do more for Jesus if we didn't talk so much. Did you hear what Job said in the sixth chapter, verse 24? Lord, teach me that I may hold my tongue. Maybe some of us need to come to the altar, stick our tongues out, lay it on the altar, and ask God to drive a nail through it. <laughs> How you like that old goosey? <laughs> drive a nail through it. Crucified tongue. Lady walked up to Uncle Buddy Robinson and said, Sister, Brother Robinson, I tell you, I'm having trouble with my tongue, but I can't get it all on the altar. And he said, Sister, the altar is 40 or 45 feet long. It looks to me like you can get your tongue on that altar. What a tongue. I knew a lady that came to my church. She had a whopper of her tongue. And she knew her Bible, too. She memorized lots of it. She knew, listen, she could give you an examination on the Pentateuch. You could give her an examination on the Pentateuch. She'd pass it with flying colors. Give her an examination on the Synoptic Gospels. She'd pass it with flying colors. She knows her Bible. She knows how to pray. She knows how to testify. But she got a tongue, man. You have to fold it up to get it in her mouth. I mean, she stands up the sink washing dishes, can lick her neighbor four or five miles down the road without moving away from the sink. We'd have better victory if we didn't talk so much. Say amen or go home. I love you so much, I'm going to tell you the truth. If it kills the old man, let him die. If it kills the old woman, let her die. If it makes all the children sick, let them vomit. The truth will set us free. I wouldn't give you a penny with a whole punch slap through it for a preacher that couldn't dig me out and step on my toes every once in a while. I like it. Some people don't, but I do. I like to hear a preacher get up and preach the old-fashioned rugged truth. Did you know James had some practical things to say about the tongue? Maybe you didn't know that. James had some practical th things to say about the tongue. He said, all matter of beasts have been tamed by mankind, but nobody can tame that tongue. Nobody can tame it. He said, you can put a bit in a horse's mouth, turn him to the right or the left. You can't turn that tongue. That ship out there on the ocean, it's changing its course by a little thing that's called a rudder. 
but not so with the tongue, brother. It's a destructive thing. More churches have been split. More families have separated. More souls have been damned because of an unruly tongue. An unruly tongue. It's full of deadly poison. It burns quicker than any flame. You heard about the young boy and the young girl walking down the street? They were teenagers, 17 or 18 years old. They walked down the street holding hands. I guess they loved each other. He didn't say anything to her for a long time. He had an inferiority complex. He didn't know how to talk to a girl. Pretty soon she looked up and said, Billy, why don't you say, don't you say something? He said, all right, will you marry me? She said, yes, I will. He never said any more for about 10 minutes. Finally, she said, why don't you say something else? He said, I think I've already talked too much. <laughs> and maybe that's where some of us are. Maybe we've talked too much. God help us. That unruly tongue. Listen, folk, I'm not as dumb as I look. And I hope you aren't. But I wasn't born yesterday. But I've pastored a few years. And I've preached a few years. And I've seen this time after time where one tongue would start wagging unnecessarily. If we're crucified with Christ, our tongues will not wag unnecessarily. I've seen it in the church. One tongue will start wagging. Pretty soon another tongue will start wagging. Pretty soon another tongue will start wagging. Pretty soon this tongue's wagging all over the place. I mean flapping on both ends like it's hung up in the middle, just flapping at both ends. And it's not long till the church is split. And young people are driven off. Have no desire to come back to the church. All because of an unruly tongue. Did you know the Bible says grievous words stirreth up strife? Is it grievous or grievous? Grievous words stirreth up strife, but a soft answer turneth away wrath. In a home some time ago, a husband and wife they were having difficulty. They just couldn't get along some way. They just talk too much to each other, you know. And the husband said, the wife said to the husband, Honey, why can't we get along like our team of horses? And he said, There's only one tongue between our horses. And there's too many tongue and too much tongue between our problems. And that's why lots of times we find people's having problems in the home because of an unruly tongue. I've never read any place in the Bible where Jesus gossiped about anybody. And if we're crucified with Christ, we ought not to gossip about people. Don't gossip about our new president. Don't gossip about a nice vice president. Don't gossip about the evangelist. Don't gossip about your pastor. Don't gossip about people. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's not run each other down. Let's talk about Jesus. Crucified tongue. I've got to quit. I've got one more. I ask you to have a crucified heart. Have a crucified heart. Did you know Jesus had a crucified heart? Some, listen, somebody said he died of a broken heart. That's true. He had a crucified heart. He died of a broken heart. Why? Because he came into his own, and his own received him not. He died of a broken heart. John chapter 1, verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The centurion walked up with a spear and put it up in his blessed side and pushed and twisted and pushed and twisted and pushed and twisted until it punctured his heart and blood and water squirted out. He had a crucified heart. Do we have a crucified heart? Is our heart a throne upon which he abides? Have you given him preeminence? Have you given him first place? Did you hear what it said in Matthew 6, 33? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All of these things shall be added. That's the reason I read the Bible first. 
That's the reason I pray first. He's the first person I want to talk to in the morning. His book is the first book I want to read at night. Every dollar that I get, the first thing that falls is the tithe and the offering. I put him first. Him first. Give him preeminence. Seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these other things will be added unto you. Is your heart divided between the Lord and the devil? Is your heart fixed? Like David said, my heart's fixed. I will sing and give you praise. We can have a fixed heart, a good, saved, and sanctified heart. Thank God we can be fixed even in the midst of biological weapons and SARS and terrorists. We can have a fixed heart in a world that's so fearful. Have you given him first? <laughs> first place? When I married this little lady right over here, when I married her, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, sickness and health, psoriasis and all. <laughs> Bless your heart, honey. When I married her, I didn't say, now, sweetheart, I'm going to give you nine months out of the year. I'm going to give you myself nine months out of the year. She said, oh, no, you don't bust her. Not nine months, 12 months. I'm, I didn't say I'm going to love you some of the time. She said, I want you to love me all the time. That's what the Lord wants. He wants you to love him all the time. He wants you to give him your all. Presenting your body as a living sacrifice. Every part of your body belongs to him. You heard about the fellow that went up to the ticket office and said to the agent, I'd like to have a ticket for Virginia, please. He said, all right, what part of Virginia? <laughs> he said, what part of her? Well, all of her, that's my wife. I want a ticket for Virginia. I don't want some of her to go or part of her to go. I want all of her to go with me. And that's what the Lord wants. He wants all of us to go with him. Amen? That's the way it ought to be. I thank God for that. A lady came up to me some time ago and she said she had heart trouble. I said, how do you know? She said, when that heart, that heart acts up, she said, I've got to sit down. I can't walk. My hands swell up. I can't hear the best. My eyes get fuzzy. My tongue gets thick. I said, you mean to tell me when your heart acts up, it affects the members of your body? She said, it does. I got a new illustration. Now I know why some people are having trouble with their feet, their hands, their ears, their eyes, and their tongue. They have heart trouble. Get the heart fixed up. Everything will be all right. Amen. I thought about Marine. He was shipped over here to be operated on to get shrapnel out of his heart. And the doctor opened him up. I mean, opened up that chest cavity. Took out the heart. Cut it right out. Laid over here on the table and split it open. And took out all the foreign objects. All the foreign objects. And then he sewed it back up, massaged it, put it back in his chest cavity, and sewed him up. And in a few days, he's up walking around. I said, man, what medical science could do today? It's amazing, isn't it? But Dr. Jesus can do something better than that. Did you know he can come into your heart without making an incision? He can come into your heart and take out envy, jealousy, malice, avarice, covetousness. He can take out all of these terrible spirits that's enmity against God and never charge you a penny. Fill you with the Holy Ghost, never charge you a penny. You don't have to have white cross, blue cross, red cross, purple cross. You don't have to have any kind of an insurance. All you need to do is present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and the very God of peace will sanctify you holy. Give yourself completely to him. Crucified with Christ. Give him your best. I'm glad I did when I was 20. I was sorry that I didn't do it sooner. When I was 20 years old, I said, there's not much left, but what's left is yours. And I gave it all to him. I gave him my best. And he has my best today. It's all on the order. Praise the Lord. What was that song that you sang? He's all I need. And really, that's all we need. I mean, if you have Jesus, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. Just keep your little hand in God's big hand and keep walking with the king. He'll take you through. Are you holding anything back? Don't do it. Like the little boy got his arm caught in a valuable vase, couldn't get it out. 
His mother worked ferociously trying to get that arm out and couldn't do it. Called the husband in from the office. He poured hot sudsy water around it trying to get it out and couldn't do it. It was a valuable vase. It was an antique. They called the family physician. He came in. He tried to get the arm out and couldn't do it. So now what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to break that vase. We're just going to have to break it. And the father says, that antique, it's worth thousands of dollars. And the doctor said his arm's worth more than that crazy antique piece. The father said, before we break the face, let me try one more time. He got down on his knees and said, Johnny, look at Daddy right in the face. Hold your hand straight out like you see Daddy doing and pull as hard as you can. And the little boy said, but Daddy, if I hold my hand out like that, I'll drop the penny I'm holding on to. And that father said, if you'll drop that penny, I'll give you 100 brand new pennies if you'll pull your arm out. He dropped the penny, out came the arm. I know some people today, they're holding on to things. And if they would just let go and let the Lord have right away, it'd be a sight what God could do for them and through them. You know, that's what the Bible said, lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset you or the thing that so easily upset you. Lay that thing aside. Whatever that is that upsets you the easiest, lay it aside and pray and ask God to fill and thrill you. He'll do it. How many believe that? Say amen. amen. You're a wonderful crowd to preach to, and I thank God for you. Remember my text, Galatians 2.20. Say it with me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Shall we stand, please? Shake hands, you're dismissed. God bless you. Come back.